And welcome to the February 27th, 2014 Longview City Council. What you smiling so much about over there? Look at them, man. Look at Miss Shelly, man. She's grinning like a possum. Um, tonight, our prayer and pledge will be led by members of the St. Mark CME Church Youth Group. Prayer will be led by Randy Floyd, and the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Sherrod Dobbins. Would you please stand? Would you please bow your heads? Heavenly Father, thank you for caring for us and forgiving us in our sins. Please help us to remember your grace, love, and mercy. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Pastor Castile, it's good to see you tonight. You didn't work somebody over with that hand, did you? Oh, I figured you had that pulpit going to town on Sunday, just got... <laughs> it's good to see you. Please, thank you. Come see us again. Okay, Council. Uh, I don't have any citizen comment cards tonight. Is there anybody here like to speak to a matter? Mr. Crane, you're here tonight. Surely you want to say something. Hello, All right. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't have any speaker cards, but if there's anybody would like to speak to any matter for citizen comment, please come forward. Okay, they're not being so, we'll move to the presentation items, which is uh, item A is to uh, presentation to council of a recent ISO audit of building codes currently in use by the city of Longview. Skip Whittle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, good evening. My name is Skip Whittle. I currently serve as the building official for the city of Longview. And I wanna to talk to you briefly this evening about a recent ISO audit that we had with the city of Longview building inspection department. Uh, briefly, the findings uh, that we got from the audit and uh, a little bit about a plan that we have putting in place or wanna put in a place concerning uh, maintaining the uh, ratings that we currently have uh, with the ISO. Um, ISO is the, um, <clears throat> the uh, insurance services office that, that basically assign ratings to different cities based on a lot of factors. Uh, they do have effect on the insurance ratings for the city for um, properties and construction projects, uh, buildings, and so forth like that. The ISO ratings also could possibly affect um, payback money or FEMA disaster relief money. Uh, so the ratings are pretty important to the city as far as that goes. Uh, we currently had an audit with the building inspection department, as I said, with the uh, what's called the building codes um, efficiency standards. And it basically deals with the building inspection department, how we enforce our building codes and factors contributing to the overall rating of the city's building inspection department. Um, one of the findings that most would most adversely affect our current ratings is the actual current version of the building codes that we currently have adopted. The city of Longview is currently operating under the 2003 building codes and uh, we probably need to move that building code to a later or the most latest edition to uh, maintain the ratings that we currently have. <clears throat> We put a plan into effect, or we're going to propose a plan that we go ahead and look at adopting the current version of the building codes, uh, starting tonight with this presentation to council. Um, we're going to have a meeting with the Construction Advisory and Appeals Board scheduled for next week, Thursday of next week. The Construction Advisory and Appeals Board is a, a, a board, commission board that List that ha has input and it serves to one hear appeals from the building official as far as code application and interpretation and also to make recommendations to council on things like what version of the building code we should be operating under in this case uh, 
looking at adopting the 2012 codes. Um, we're going to have, we've set up a couple of community meetings where we're going to actually open this up to the public to get feedback from the public out there concerning concerns or questions or comments concerning the building code adoption. Um, the first one is scheduled for April the 2nd. And we have spoke with the Builders Association, our local Builders Association, in the past about this. This is not something new. We have been in dialogue with them for some time about ultimately adopting a newer version of the building code. We'll continue to do that. And of course, promulgation of this word through media contact. <clears throat> and I, you know, I don't know if y'all really want to go into, we have, have the slide that has a couple of significant changes that occur in the new building codes versus the old building codes. I don't know if y'all really, if this is really the forum that you want to go into with, with some of those things or not. Skip, skip, excuse me just one second. We, we all received this information and I know this, what, what Skip's saying we're trying to do is put through a process. I can tell you when we adopted the 2003 building codes, a lot of the developers didn't even know that this was even coming. So we're trying to be very transparent out front with, with what the proposed changes are. Does anybody have any questions about, these are the three main, I would say, differences, if you will, current code versus what's being proposed as a new code. Would y'all, does anybody want to, hold on, Ms. Allen? Question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Whittle, the first one there, same day surgery treated as business occupancy. I, I totally don't understand are they talking about a surgical procedure? What is that? This would be the things that you have like a dental procedure, same day surgeries where you have something that you walk into that you may have to be put to sleep, but it's done that day and it's an ambulatory patient where you leave the surgery center that same day, you don't remain overnight. And in treating how those types of occupancies, the way the building code classifies them under our current version, it's just a business occupancy, and, and there, are, there are some, there are less stringent requirements from the fire protection standpoint, and also from, from the basic occupancy determination itself, as opposed to the way those things are treated. And what they do is they consider people who have to go under, if you will, uh, not capable of self-preservation, and that's the, the direction that the code is moving, is to protect people that do spend periods of time in that state. So that's the difference in the new occupancy versus the old occupancy on it. I don't understand uh, when they when they put you under, so to speak. What does that, what 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 are we? I'm not medically inclined. What are we talking about there? Are we gonna is that does that mean we're gonna have more? Uh, what what does that mean? It basically means that, that some of the life safety issues are more stringently addressed for those occupants that do have people that for a period of time are not able to respond to either an emergency signal, be it audible, visual, and so removing them or the act of making them safe or not susceptible to that incident they're leaning more towards protection of the building and the occupants inside than they were previously in the in the older codes. Okay, what does now this is what does ambulatory care actually mean? It's just the definition that the building <coughs> code writers have given to this particularly type of occupancy. And oftentimes the way that they verbalize the what what they're seeing as a type of occupancy may or may not make a lot of sense to us. And you have to look into the definition in the building codes to understand it sometimes. But that's just the term that they have given to that particular type of service. Am ambulatory city, just like we have today out of Good Shepherd, that's a, a daytime or a day surgery facility. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, just in the interest of time, this is just the beginning of the process, is it not? Uh, That's you've got all these dates in front of us. You'll be coming back to us again, I assume, before anything is actually implemented? That's correct. Okay, so, and we'll, excuse me interrupting. And so, just for clarification and uh, to reinforce what the mayor said, I think it's really great you're doing this. There's nothing worse than a supply, a surprise, I think, if you're a builder or an insurer, right? So I've talked with a couple of builders and developers since this came up on our radar screen, also to a couple of insurance people to try to understand. And uh, 
I haven't heard anything from anybody so far that they're concerned about it. They're just glad to know that we're conversing with them now before we do anything. So it's a good process, and I'm glad we're uh, doing it this way. Okay. Did anybody else have any questions at this time on this particular slide? Okay. Anything else, Mr. Whittle? No, sir. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you all very okay. much for your attention. Again, the, the, the whole point is, you know, we've had uh, numerous issues in the, on the development side of our city services and, and one of the complaints has been lack of communication and we're trying to go out front and make sure that we communicate the potential changes that are coming and, and I want to say that just because we're showing the change after these meetings and getting with our uh, building community and whatnot doesn't mean that we're going to adopt everything, okay? Some of these codes, common sense isn't always you know, applicable, if you will. So we've got to really vet this thoroughly to make sure that the changes are made or are realistic changes. So, right, just to start. Okay, we have another presentation item, the Pedestrian Transit Access Plan. Ms. Brooke Dro Dropatini. I did it right the other day, didn't I? You did. All right. I was being too. All right. Call it a success. Twice in a row. <laughs> Mayor, council members, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm here to give you an overview of what we have accomplished on the pedestrian transit access plan. It's a project that we started last summer uh, and it's, it's been ongoing and had a lot of input from a lot of different people. We have had key stakeholders from both the city's side as well as the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization and uh, in even uh, input from the Transit Advisory Committee and the, the um, board members on the MPO as well. So uh, a lot of great input has gotten us to where we're at today and uh, we just would like to share an overview of the project here with you too. There we go. Okay, starting the project out, we had uh, four main goals and objectives to get accomplished. First, we looked at the, the study boundaries of the project include three of the major corridors here in the city of Longview, uh, Moberly, Cotton Street, and 4th Street. On those four, cor or three corridors, I'm sorry, on those three corridors, we, identif we first started out by identifying the inventory of the existing conditions. What were, was out there on the ground right now that pedestrians were using to access the transit services on these three corridors? From there, we identified a list of improvements that could improve their access and make it easier for them to get to the buses. We prioritized those improvements and then finally looked at a funding piece of how can we uh, get these constructed and on the ground. Now starting out with the inventory of the existing conditions, this started out with uh, gathering the GIS information from city staff and the information include things like the aerial imagery, the existing sidewalks that were there. We then took that and went out in the field and actually field verified what was on the ground. So uh, we looked at the existing sidewalk facilities and were able to rank them uh, with their conditions. Are they in good condition, fair condition, poor condition? And then where were the missing links between those? We conducted the transit assessment uh, using some of the GIS information. We looked and found the pockets within the city that had uh, a high propensity to have transit riders. These were locations where, you know, you may not have uh, access to a automobile, so public transit would be a, uh, a must. And from that, we put all those pieces together and we identified the different improvements for that connectivity. Um, improvements include such things as the, the sidewalks and the ramps uh, to help um, ADA compliance on the ramps and as, as well as safer intersection crossings where uh, people were trying to cross over busier intersections. We took what we had to date then and we ran it through the public with two different methods. First was a series of uh, surveys that were conducted on board the, the actual transit buses online to capture non-riders and then with the paratransit users. We followed that up with a public forum uh, that first week as well on November 7th over here at the public library and we laid out all of our maps and 
we invited everybody to just come and look and see exactly what we were proposing and uh, received their combat, uh, comments, and we actually did a lot of uh, tweaks to our recommendations based on those comments. The types of improvements that we ended up with were four main areas. The ADA ramps and sidewalks to help uh, push some of the paratransit users over to the fixed route services. The pedestrian signal heads at the traffic signals to allow the pedestrian safer crossings. Then the installation of some traditional uh, traffic signals that you have. Uh, there were some locations where that seemed to be the right fit. And then finally, the installation of a hawk pedestrian signal. And what those are is they're, they're pedestrian activated and they are in use whenever a uh, pedestrian is there to cross the intersection or mid-block crossing is the main location and the location where we used them here. So, um, and I can, I can explain that a little bit later on another slide. This is, a, uh, this is just going to give you an example of one of the projects that we had, just to give you an overview. This is down on Moberly and High Street, where they intersect. The red lines that you see on your screen are the locations of the existing sidewalks, and the yellow dotted line is the existing bus route. And so what we were seeing were a high number of pedestrians being dropped off on the side of Workforce Solutions, and they were walking across to the main post office and uh, Letourneau's Technology Center there to the south. So our recommendations at this location was first to infill the pieces of uh, missing sidewalks. The green lines show where we're just going back in with some proposed sidewalk features. And then two uh, installations of those hawk pedestrian signals that I was telling you about. And this will allow the pedestrians, whenever they were making that crossing, to push the button and have more of a protected crossing rather than darting out in between the cars. Along with these improvements, we would install the ADA ramps and uh, new uh, pavement markings to really highlight those crosswalks and have them a safe crossing. Overall, across the three corridors, this is how the improvements broke down. Moberly Avenue uh, occurred the most projects as well as the most cost, and that was the, due to the fact that this is the location that we're seeing the most pedestrian access to transit along. It's also the location that had the uh, highest number of existing sidewalks in poor condition. And so uh, given that, the cost for that uh, corridor uh, came in at right at $1.5 million. In total, across all three corridors, our total uh, cost with the recommended projects and the replacement of existing sidewalks due to poor conditions is running right at $2.5 million, a little under. So the la last piece that I mentioned was identifying uh, funding sources that the city can use to be able to implement these projects. And we did that on two accounts. First, on a local level, what you would be looking at is uh, through the implementation of a city bond specifically designated to the construction of these pedestrian improvements or uh, the incorporation them into your capital improvement program that you have in place. Some of the non-local potential for funding um, uh, occurs across the board, and the report goes in and highlights several. The couple that we'll talk about here, is the prime candidates where you really have the likelihood of receiving funding is either through the Transportation Alternative Program uh, or the Community Development Block Grant. That's a program that the city has used successfully on other types of projects throughout the city. Some of the other locations that are a little bit more specific of projects being in certain areas of the city would include the Main Street Improvement Program. These would be projects centered around the downtown area. The Rails to Highway Crossing Program, which is um, providing uh, better access near a railroad crossing. This, uh, we have one of those projects on Cotton Street. And then finally, a Livable Community Initiative Program. Now, all these projects can't take place overnight, and so through the process of uh, the committees and the stakeholders, we have identified a, three groups for the projects, short range, uh, projects identified for uh, implementation between the next zero to two years. Mid-range would be the two to five year mark, and then long-range projects we'd like to have implemented within 10 years. 
<clears throat> now at this time, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions about the project. I'm, I'm an engineer, so I can dive into nerdiness if you would let me, so. Not Ms. Dropteen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know I'm gonna have some questions. Questions, okay. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Tasha. Uh, they, they you call me Tasha. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, thank you. Great <laughs> no. presentation. Um, about the CDBG funds, those dollars are getting smaller. So they is are. this a different pot of CDBG money we're, we're speaking in terms of, or is this the same that we already applied for? Unfortunately, it's the same. Well, you might as well scratch that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I had I to ask that, that question. And then the other two, um, the one uh, about the the could you go back to the slide yep the real high thank you the rail highways crossing program with and the texas main street improvements program mm -hmm. would those two be applicable to what you all are proposing that we do now like would would those funds be if we were to secure those funds mm -hmm. would they be able would they fit the criteria for what we're looking at doing now there are a few projects within okay. and we have 14 projects overall and there are a handful of the projects that would fit the criteria for those fundings. Now, okay. just like the uh, CDBG grant money that you know, the, these are highly competitive right. areas to, to receive funding in. And so um, it would be one of those, it would be a process to get it and, and have that. But we do have some projects that are specific to those programs and, and they fit say, the criteria. And when you say highly competitive, let me be clear, we on the same page, meaning shovel ready, ready to go, pretty much to get those dollars. Yes, that would be one component of it okay. to, to really have your ducks in a row to be ready to hand out the money. The other is um, there's a lot of communities just like Longview, mm -hmm. size wise, and, and everybody comes to the, to so the place. We're all, <laughs> so uh, so you, you have to, you really have to show why your project would be to be to the top. And it may be that um, d depending on the, the dollars that are allotted <laughs> that year, it may not be in your best interest to pursue that. It may take it. too much of your uh, staff's time to really get the reward from that funding And dollars. that was my last question. Mm -hmm. Staff would have to apply for that yes it would okay. and so you, you would have to weigh that the the process with the staff applying for the dollars with the actual um, likelihood of getting the funding yes. and the funding that's available and that varies every right. year and what those dollars are looking like okay. and unfortunately <laughs> Small no yeah. one is handing out free money these yeah. days. I hate yeah. that. It really makes our jobs difficult. But yeah. the larger cities like Dallas, when I attend different meetings, like what Dallas is doing with their transit, with their whole transportation mm -hmm. infrastructure and everything, mm -hmm. I looked at the plan and I was like, well, there's all the money. So I do understand. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank Eight, you. Very good presentation. 20. Yeah. Eighty percent of the time, you're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me. Let me. Let me. Um, suggest several things and make a couple comments. Um, we had the presentation uh, at our MPO uh, meeting last week uh, and I appreciate your information and we didn't have the different sources of potential funding or grant options so it's good for us to at least have some ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, Council, I would suggest that that's probably the very back end of the, of the funding scenario. If you got any of that, we'd call that lanyap <laughs> but you don't go in planning for it because you're probably not going to get it. Let, let, let me make a couple comments. One, um, this has been a subject about pedestrian sidewalks uh, in our community for quite some time. Uh, and Longview is historically a community that was developed through, um, you know, acquiring, you know, annexing and you know, some of the way properties were built in the annexed areas did not require, you know, sidewalks or even infrastructure that's comparable even close to what we do today. Uh, I, I'd recommend to council that we have a discussion about the entire city of Longview and, and look at the major, th we have it in North Longview, East Longview is developing now, West Longview, South Longview, we, we really need to consider 
a, a citywide program, okay? And again, prioritize it like you've discussed. But in doing so, look at a long-term project, okay? To where we could associate funding, okay, to pay over, it may take seven, five to seven years to do that. We would look, be looking at not only from our, our general fund sourcing, we might be talking about certificates of obligation. We might be talking about there's going to be, you know, yeah, I'm not going to be here, but there may be other bond elections for additional projects that we could include some sidewalks in like we did in the 2011 bond election. But we'd have to consider long-term funding sources. And, and let me just say this, you know, county advocacy. You know, county, it's one thing elections do. You hear about all these these pockets of monies and things, whether they're there or not there. But I mean, again, this is partnerships with county advocacy throughout our city that we could improve not only our own infrastructure, but the infrastructure of the county. And, and if we're working together closely, like what we're trying to do, some of that, that if those big dollars are sitting there, could go toward helping with some of this. And I think most of the commissioners, most of the commissioners would consider that. But it's got to be a program, you know, that we can really get our arms around. And what I'd like to ask is that within the next 90 days before we even start the, um, you know, the, the budget process for this year, that uh, staff start putting together a, a project, okay, to address the entire city. Again, you know, setting setting priorities, okay. But let, let's let's look at a citywide project uh, where we can really, you know, take a big bite of this and get this done, okay. Can I ask one last question? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, let me just so I can have it clear in my head. Those three projects that you've identified are the ones that seem to play the most integral role in our current transportation system? The the three corridors? Corridors, yes, yes. Uh, yes, those were identified at the onset of the project through um, the, the setting up the project and all that, that those were the three corridors to look at. And the bottom line figure was that $2.1 million for uh, those three? Just combined? slightly less than 2.5. Okay. okay. 2.5 <clears throat> is okay. where the numbers are standing at now. And that um, that includes the, the new improvements that the the plan identified and was uh, hashed out and then also some of the existing conditions that are, are, are ranking in poor condition right now and that that was um, broken concrete um, some discontinuous surfaces um, that really just made it inaccessible mm -hmm. right okay okay thank you well, Ms. Manley? yeah a couple thoughts on this the certainly the um, long-term comprehensive plan that we're working on now will incorporate this. I'm sure you're well aware of that yes. since your company's involved in that. Um, so we just need to, all of us, remember that and make sure we're encouraging Freeze and Nichols and uh, other constituencies that this needs to be part of it. And then I think of the uh, the great work we did down on um, MLK and Green Street and how great that was. And that was only two miles of sidewalks and how much money that cost. And I know up in my part of town, I mean, at least in the south side of town, we got some sidewalks that might be broken up. Up, up on our end of town, Mayor, we ain't got no sidewalks. That's right. So um, there's a need all over town, and I'm glad we're talking about this. This is something that's really, really important to me, and I'd like to see sidewalks in every neighborhood in this city at some point in time. So. Okay. And it Thank would you. also be great to see them where they're most needed. Yes, yeah. definitely. <laughs> That's well, the key. And I was going to say something about that. Information is really powerful. That little uh, map you had of where we had the most people that had the mm -hmm. fewest number of cars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. That's where we need to start. Well, and like all that. of that is broken down in our report. Yeah. And like I say, that's that's the engineering side that's of it. You're, side. you're hitting okay, my we'll love there. So. <laughs> we'll stop here. I don't <laughs> oh, want man. you to get out of control or anything. I thought I was going to get the, the <laughs> mic for the rest of the night here. But, Council, I think I think the message is we need a citywide program and and it's time to put this in a place to where action starts happening we've talked about it we've beat this thing around it's time to get a program and and, and that's exactly right the comprehensive plan is a good place to start but uh we, we'd, we'd like to start looking at some i'm not sure if freeze and nichols is still going to be you know engaged with us as we try to move this forward or, or exactly you know what that program is but anyway Kevin said he's gonna pay him some money <laughs> <laughs>
We're paying him enough money, man, with that CPAC deal, right? All right. <laughs> We'll leave that to Mr. Bridges. You'll negotiate <laughs> that. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Appreciate thank you, guys. You being I appreciate here. it. Council, that's all the presentation items. We have the uh, consent agenda. Is there any item on the consent agenda that council would like to uh, pull for separate conversation or discussion? I'd like to say something. Call it by A. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Frost. Item uh, A. Item A of the uh, compressed natural gas fueling station. Uh, I think it's worth noting that uh, we're not spending any capital money. This company is putting that in and says we're going to buy the fuel from them. So we're out. We're not out the 400000 or whatever it was to uh, put these stations in. <clears throat> any other questions? If not, may I have a motion. Move to approve. Have a motion. Second, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, motion passes. Action item resolution authorizing city staff to acquire right of way parcel. Let's see, we're going to have Keith Bonds. Man. Boy, we went straight to the top tonight on this deal. That's right. <laughs> Thank we're you. rolling tonight, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, <laughs> Council. As I'm sure City Council is fairly familiar with the 4th Street project and uh, probably with the property that we're going to discuss tonight, but I would like to go over a few things with you first. Uh, how the origin of the project started, the route selection, the property be acquired, some necessity of the acquisition and the public nature of the acquisition. First, I'll start with the origins of the project. This was the original proposal the city was uh, met with about a year ago or a little bit over a year ago, I guess was uh, two property owners that this 4th Street extension would cross had this proposal with the city. And at that time, the city's only involvement was the two portions of the street that crossed Hensley Park. Well, so after that time, uh, the two property owners decided they didn't want to work together any longer, and one of the property owners uh, brought this proposal to the city where the 4th Street extension would enter into Hawkins Parkway at the only piece of property he had that fronted Hawkins, which created this offset intersection, which is very undesirable and creates congestion and driver confusion. and. Uh, so that left us with, uh, we went and the city took over the project, the design, the property acquisition, and the construction of the project, and brought us back to what we're calling the 4th Street Extension, which is kind of like the original proposal. So from that point, it brings us to this uh, property that we're talking about tonight. This is the expanded view of the 1.922 acre track of land where the city is actually only going to take the very northeast corner of the property. This is the survey of the property itself that we'll be acquiring is 0 0.1235 acres or 5,380 square feet. We're also going to acquire a 10 foot wide utility easement and a 15 foot wide temporary construction easement. Now the reason why the street as it goes northerly from Hawkins and bends to the west would be to avoid the 100-year floodplain and the 100-year floodway where you are not allowed to do any roadway embankment. Now we did an analysis if we were to avoid the property and to cross the 100-year floodway the roadway would look kind of like what you're seeing in red and since we're not able to do any embankment in the hatched area we'd have to build a bridge through that area and the bridge cost to appraised value of the property comparison is what you're looking at. The bridge would uh, be somewhere in the $2.275 million range and the appraised value of the property is 53537 So the necessity of this acquisition, it would create a very minimal impact we feel like on the property owner. It is the most uh, cost effective route. It, uh, if we don't do that, we'll have to build a bridge over that floodway. If we don't do either one of those, the alternate route would create an offset intersection that again creates congestion and driver confusion. We feel like the, there's several public, um, the nature of the, the public nature of the acquisition, I guess, is that the proposed intersection is going to look like all the rest of the intersections that we're going to have on Hawkins. Council's aware that we're doing improvements at Eastman, Judson, McCann, and Gilmer, all at Hawkins. This intersection is going to operate and look just like those. Uh, it does provide access for all the adjoining properties. It 
provides public utility access for all the adjoining properties. It has no special benefit to any third party which is not available to the general public and is consistent with the council's adopted master transportation plan. So uh, at that I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have before I ask you to make and approve a motion. Question to Mr. Bonds. Mr. Manley. Just uh, to get everything out in the open, so to speak, before we engage in something that most of us probably don't want to do, eminent domain and taking people's land, um, talk a little bit about the efforts made to, without getting too much specifics, efforts made to try to get this done without eminent domain. Yeah, well, the state legislature requires us to make do several steps. We send a property owner a notice that we're in need of the property. Um, send them what is called the Landowner's Bill of Rights. And there's a certain period of days they have to review that. Then we make a, a bona fide offer on the property, negotiate back and forth on that. Then we have an appraisal and that uh, the, that's approved uh, uh, this normally by the state of Texas. Uh, if we were doing it for them, this time we use the same procedures as we do when we are acquiring highway right away, I should say. But, uh, and then, you know, more negotiations back and forth, but uh, failed to come to any. It's not a taking at all. We're trying to purchase the property at an appraised value. Okay. That's right. Good point. The take was uh, not intentional. I didn't mean to sure. say it that way. But before we do something like this, but what I'm hearing you say is there's a process. The process was followed. The individual who owns the property was aware of his rights, what the process was going to be. And if he didn't try to work with us and to reach some kind of resolution, that this was going to be the end result. That's correct. You understood all of that. Let me okay, thank you. make another point, too, about the state statutes. It is, does it serve the public good? And that's a very important consideration here. And it is our opinion that this does serve the public good of the citizens of Longview. <laughs> Garrett? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Bonds, did the property owner have any difficulties with that appraised value? Uh, that was. I assume he didn't like it. Yes, sir. So did he get back with you with any difficulties? He just said it wasn't enough money. It's not enough money. Okay. Well, what, what was the aspiration for that particular piece of property? Uh, How much did he want for it? How much do you want for it? <coughs> a lot more than it was appraised for. A half a million or something? Of that I'm, I'm not sure That's what he. Kind of excessive. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. This is Mr. Allen. Uh, Mr. Bonds, could we put the uh, picture back up there that showed the location of the property? And okay, now we're talking about that triangle in the uh, upper right-hand corner. Are we? Uh, what are we talking about under eminent domain? Oh, that right little there. bit right there. Okay, the the owner, current owner of that property, does he also own other property? That were that, uh, or he owns all that area there. He owns 1.922 acres. Yes, it fronts Hawkins along here, and it will front Fourth Street around, along here. So he, through the development of this street, his value will increase due to the, due to the frontage that he will have now on the new uh, street going north. Then, so I, he. I'm not an appraiser, but that's an well, as, an assumption you could make. Reasonable assumption sure. that. Uh, that the value will go up. Uh, okay, I just wanted to see what additional property he had that he would benefit from this street going in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I think Mr. Manley, you know, he personally was somewhat involved in, in trying to move this project forward, and I think it's very obvious that um, this wasn't gonna, gonna work. We've tried. Uh, and, and the other point Ms. Manley made was it's not our intention to have to use them in a domain, but at some point in time when you're trying to serve, we're trying to serve the public good, uh, we're left with no other options, okay? So that, and that's where we find ourselves today. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Four lane or five, what, what type of road are we gonna construct? Five lane. Five lane with a center no, turn. You know, I don't think so. <coughs> May I have a motion? <laughs> let, me, let me say something, just because I, I can tell where this is headed, but let me say the two things I probably would have waited to say. Uh, public need and fairness here. So clearly this is in the public need, because as I understand it, that the day this street opens up, whether it's a two-lane road, a three-lane road, or in this case, a five-lane road, it's gonna be one of the busiest streets in our city. Isn't that what we were told when the, yes. the sur traffic survey was done? So as we began the discussions of whether or not we wanted to pursue as a council eminent domain, 
one of the things that we discussed was how upset our citizens would be with us if we didn't do something like this and if we actually had to go fall back on the, I think, second slide you put up showing that uh, offset. And I can imagine my fellow citizens coming up to that street, having to make a left and make a quick right to access the new 4th Street. Mm -hmm. Totally impractical. And uh, again, when you consider the, the safety of our citizens, which I think is one of the most important roles of a city government, this is exactly what we're doing. And yeah, we're, we're buying someone's property at fair value, we're not taking it, but we're, we're providing for the thousands, really, of citizens that are gonna be traveling up and down that street the day that it opens, the day that it opens, so public need. And then secondly, fairness. I think we've been completely fair with this gentleman. I know the man, I know the property owner, and uh, I think he's been given every opportunity to try to work with us. And the fact that he and the other property owners have gotten into a little bit of a cat fight has nothing to do with us. We just need to do what's right, take care of our citizens, and I think this is completely fair in what we need to do. Okay, so, is that, thank you. when I kind of take that as a form of a motion? Well, I need to read the motion and, oh, and he well, can make it. Okay, okay. be, be patient. Uh, it's, Pardon me? Be patient, it's long. You know that's, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, that's a gig of my name. Well, I'd like to ask that you make and approve the following motion. I move that the City of Longview authorize the use of the power of eminent domain to acquire certain property in the PP Rain Survey, Abstract 258, City of Longview, Gregg County, Texas. Said property consisting of a parcel of land approximately 0 0.1235 acres, a permanent utility easement of approximately 1,503 square feet, and a temporary construction easement of approximately 2,679 square feet, all of said parcels being a portion of the same tract of land which was called a 1.922 acres and conveyed from Curtis Investments, Longview LLC, to Westco Family Limited Partnership. By an instrument of record in clerk's file 20122, 3253 Gregg County Public Records said 0 0.1235 acre parcel said utility easement and said temporary construction easement all being more particularly described in attachment A of the resolution before you tonight for the purpose of constructing both a public roadway extending 4th Street and certain associated public improvements including without limitation public drainage improvements, public sanitary, sanitary sewer improvements and public water pipeline improvements. Now did you get so it all? <laughs> yes. Are you sure? I wonder if Mr. Yackley got it all. So good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so that's a motion and I have a I have a motion for that motion in a second. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Bonds. Thank you. Well, Mr. Bonds. That's the most Mr. Bonds has ever talked at a council meeting. <laughs> All right, items of community interest. Brother Sims. I was reading in the paper where uh, our uh, early voting turnout is pretty uh, dismal. And I just want to remind the uh, citizens to get out and vote and if you don't go vote then uh don't say anything uh don't don't come up here racing cane with us about certain things so get out there and vote okay i don't have anything Let's get in there. really <laughs> all right oh wait a minute wait 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 we, uh, we got notification uh, this week on an award that Mr. Gary Smith, you want to tell us real quick what award you received? Uh, CMO, you told me? CMO. Oh, yeah. Uh, I Certified. I received a, we attend these TML meetings once a year through the city government here. And uh, I guess the year 2013, I achieved a CMO award, which is defined as the Certified Municipal Official and uh, I hadn't got any paperwork. Well, I, got, I did get the paperwork yep. that uh, went to Austin, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to attend those meetings. Yep. The people it's a, it, is, it is a big deal, though, because it's a series of meetings and trainings that, that you go through to obtain that award. So congratulations, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Ms. Cashew. <clears throat> I want to thank everyone who has supported um, Top Ladies of Distinction, Top Teens of America. We had a very successful event, 33rd Hearts of Love. Uh, thank you to the mayor. Thank you to Councilman Manley. Thank you to Councilman Gary Smith, who just handed me a check. <laughs> and uh, just thank everyone. And uh, in fact, I'm leaving after council meeting to attend our 43rd Area One Conference. And it's actually in our region this year. It's in Shreveport. Um, so uh, pray for me and just thank everyone for your support. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Frost, Mr. Manley. Two things. 
Uh, following up on Mr. Sims, early voting is open through tomorrow, I believe. So if you haven't voted already, you still can go vote through tomorrow. Secondly, the comprehensive plan that we mentioned earlier, the survey is open, I believe, through tomorrow, isn't it? Um, Mary Ann? Okay, thank you. I always look at Mary Ann, right? So um, the next step, amongst others, is that the committee will be looking for subcommittees to take specific initiatives on parks, on streets, and other things. So if you would like to be involved, please let uh, the city manager's office know. We'll be looking for folks to man or woman those subcommittees, and we'd like to have you involved if you can be. So please get involved in our comprehensive plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Mr. Allen. Real simple, step outside and enjoy the wonderful weather we're having. Good you see how cold it was? Cold. Cold. Yesterday or today? Oh, of course, you've been skiing or something, so I understand now. <laughs> Golly. Okay, Governor Rick Perry has proclaimed March 2nd through the 8th to be Severe Weather Awareness Week. The Longview Fire Department reminds you that planning and preparation can greatly reduce loss of life and property when disasters strike. Residents are encouraged to create emergency preparedness kit of important supplies and to develop emergency preparedness plans with their families. Learn more at longviewtexas.gov. Uh, also, mark your calendars for Alley Fest and the historic depot days on Friday, May 9th and Saturday, May 10th, in conjunction with the annual Downtown Alley Fest Music and Arts Festival. The City of Longview will hold a grand reopening of the renovated historic train depot. The event will feature a look back at Longview in the 1940s, as well as a variety of train-related activities. And lastly, Partners in Prevention will host a new mentor training on March the 5th, March 25th, and April 4th. Call 903-237-1019 to learn how you can become a mentor and help make a difference in a young person's life. Council meeting is adjourned.